The labor question becomes the dominant public question, particularly in the 1880s when the economy revives and is expanding rapidly and the labor movement reestablishes itself. Um, the U.S. Senate sets up a committee to investigate what it calls the relations of labor and capital. They have print five volumes, very interesting volumes of testimony of all sorts of people commenting on this. Eleanor Marx, the daughter of, of Karl Marx, tours the United States in the mid-1880s along with her husband, Edward Aveling, who is reputed to be the ugliest man in Europe, but um, I, don't, I don't know, I got to see a picture of Aveling. Um, but they write back that the labor movement in the United States is ahead of Europe. We're always asking, how come the, the American workers are not as radical as European? They were more radical in the 1880s. They were more organized. They were more developed. Eleanor Marx wrote back, Europe should follow the United States, where people are getting much better uh, organized with strikes and boycotts and political battles. Um, and uh, really it, uh, an attempt to get a modern response to the new political and social order being created so rapidly uh, in the northern United States. At the center of all this was an organization called the Knights of Labor, a, a kind of an amorphous labor organization which grew to many hundreds of thousands of members in the mid-1880s. Set, it began to recruit women workers, highly unusual for the labor movement. It opened its doors to black workers, highly unusual for the labor movement. It tried to organize industrial and agricultural workers, skilled and unskilled workers. The one group the Knights of Labor would not admit were the Chinese on the West Coast. Like many other labor groups, they wanted the exclusion of the Chinese, uh, arguing that the Chinese were not capable of understanding free labor. They came in under long-term contracts. They were called coolies. Coolie was somebody who signed a long-term contract and supposedly had no concept of what liberty was and therefore just posed a threat to American workers. Of course, there's deep racism beneath that, beneath that concept. Um, so one, might, one of the things I'm trying to ask here is what happens to social movements when they after they, when they decline, when they disappear. What happened to the abolitionist movement? The radical Republicans. You know, on the one hand, there's a generational thing. They die off, you know, they, they get old and they die. Um, but it's more than that. I think social movements have a natural lifespan and they, they eventually dissipate. Um, the big ones, the great ones, are like, I don't know, a river, a big river that eventually flows off into tributaries in different directions. They don't uh, disappear, but they're kind of transformed into something else. In the 1960s, the new left disappeared eventually, but it, f it didn't disappear, it flowed off. It's, it's alive, some of its ideas are alive today in the gay movement, in the environmental movement, in the women's movement, different tributaries. And that's what happens to abolition. A lot of abolitionism flows into the labor movement. And the labor movement of the Gilded Age claims to be the inheritor of the abolitionist tradition, even though before the Civil War, labor was not particularly, organized labor was not particularly sympathetic to, um, to abolitionism. They claim the mantle of the struggle against slavery. Their view of slavery is very different from the liberty of contract view of slavery. Slavery is um, loss of economic independence. The laborer said, Ira Stewart, one of the labor leaders of this time, feels that something of slavery still remains or something of freedom is yet to come. Freedom has not been achieved by the Civil War and the 13th Amendment. Now, the fact is the Northern labor movement did little or nothing to address the situation of the former slaves. They did not see the plight of the former slaves as, in a sense, their own a problem akin to their situation. But as I say, they picked up the language, the language of equal citizenship from Reconstruction, the language of free labor, and used it to critique the, um, the social order that was, that was emerging. Um, so 
what, what the Knights of Labor and many organized laborers thought, were aiming at was in a way to restore the old notion of the harmony between capital and labor, which had been dissipated. They, these are not class conscious, radical, so, there were socialists around and anarchists, but the core of the Knights of Labor were really free laborites trying to restore a, a kind of vision of Lincoln's America of harmony of interest be between producers and workers, talked about cooperative production, talked about land reform, again, go back to the Homestead Act, maybe make it easier for people to get land. But they also, they, they reinvigorated Lincoln's rhetoric about the right to enjoy the fruits of your own labor. Slavery is denying people the fruits of their own labor and workers are not enjoying the fruits of their own labor in this, in this society. Uh, George McNeil, a major leader of the Knights of Labor says, we complain that our rulers and statesmen have not attempted to engraft Republican principles into our industrial system. The, the Republic, in other words, the principles of political democracy have not been applied to the economy, to our industrial system. There is an inevitable and irrepressible conflict between the wage system of labor and the Republican system of government. So you see the words of Seward, the irrepressible conflict. But now it's no longer North versus South, it's the system of labor and the political system. When people are working for wages and can never get out of that situation and are trapped in a low wage uh, life, that is antithetical to a democratic system of government. The words of Seward updated for the industrial industrial era. Um, we will talk more next time about how in the South the options, once from the end of Reconstruction, the options for black Americans shrink. They shrink. Politics becomes less and less of an avenue through which they can seek to improve their condition or try to express their aspirations. For a time, it's the Knights of Labor which becomes the vehicle in the South for black aspirations. As I said, the Knights of Labor actually welcomes black workers, which is highly unusual in the 19th and in even much of the 20th century for uh, organized labor. And by the early 1890s, blacks are flocking into it. Tenant farmers, railroad workers, lumber workers, desperately seeking a way to exert some power in the South with politics being completely uh, eliminated. Um, it doesn't, they don't succeed, but it shows, you know, again, it, it shows you that people try to find different ways of improving their, you know, uh, their, their lives. When one avenue is blocked off, they, they don't just go away, they try to find other avenues.